Good evening, everyone. And for those who are tuning in from China, uh, good morning. Uh, that include Wei Wen. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Flying with Phoenix speaker series hosted by LTF Ventures here at University of Chicago. I'm David from LTF Ventures. Uh, the Flying with Phoenix speaker series was launched last year uh, in order to support uh, and bring together entrepreneurial community here at University of Chicago and has since expanded to cover other universities. Uh, so we welcome uh, students from all around the world to join us uh, in this webinar with uh, Wei Wen for the next hour. And it is a great pleasure to have uh, Wei Wen to join us all the way from Shanghai today. Um, so welcome, Wei Wen. Thank you, David. And uh, very excited and honored to uh, have this opportunity to speak to many of you. Uh, I should also apologize that uh, we kind of postponed this uh, by, by a bit because I had a important uh, client, client meeting uh, kind of last minute. So apologize for that. Completely understandable. Um, so uh, before we jump into uh, many of those great questions that students have submitted, and I welcome all students to uh, submit questions through the Q&A functions here uh, on Zoom while uh, the conversation is still going on. Uh, I'm just going to provide a bit of an uh, introduction uh, to Wei Wen's uh, background, a little bit of a bio so we can uh, better understand the context uh, of the questions. Uh, so as you know, Wei Wen is the managing partner of Bain's Greater China offices uh, based in Shanghai. He's also a member of the firm's uh, global board of directors. Uh, he's a leader in Bain's private equity practice and a senior member of the digital consumer product and uh, retail uh, practices. Wei Wen has more than 25 years of management consulting experience advising leading investment companies, including private equity firms. Since joining Bain in 2002, Wei Wen has served clients in Bain's Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Los Angeles offices. Wei Wen earned an MBA from uh, no other but the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, uh, as well as a Bachelor of Science degree from Fudan University, uh, which is located in Shanghai. Uh, again, welcome, Wei Wen. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I would only add a note uh, uh, beyond the very uh, accurate <laughs> and, uh, and the comprehensive uh, intro. Uh, I, I currently wear three hats uh, within, within Bain. Uh, one is uh, uh, as a client partner. So about 70% of my time is still to work with uh, my clients uh, or, or Bain's clients. Uh, and then I actually grew up at Bain a little bit in an unconventional way, uh, in the sense that I practically started the local uh, Chinese client business. So majority of my, my clients actually are local uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. So uh, kind of related to uh, the venture uh, uh, that, uh, that David, you're running, uh, I, 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 I work uh, primarily with the principal investors, either, either financial investors uh, like yourself or uh, just entrepreneurs who bet all of their life on, uh, on businesses. So that's kind of my, my, my 70% uh, time. And then 20% of my time is running uh, the Bain Greater China uh, business. We have a uh, uh, pretty scaled business. We have about 40 partners and a few hundred uh, consultants of, uh, of different sorts. Um, and then we're growing the fastest in the market, uh, close to 20% a year for the past five years since I, I started running uh, this, uh, this region. And then 10% of my time is the, the board of director job. Uh, Bain is a uh, kind of a special organization. It's a private company. Uh, and then the board, is, you know, we don't have independent board members. So all of the 10 board members are uh, executives of the company, if you will. Uh, and then we basically uh, govern uh, from a board perspective, the long-term financial and the strategic health uh, for the company while we have a separate line called the Operating Committee who runs the day-to-day -day, uh, business. So just a brief you know, introduction about my, my background so that uh, you also understand where some of my comments will come from later. Awesome, um, thank you for that very helpful clarification. That's actually quite interesting to hear that as the head of uh, Bank Grid of China, only 20% uh, of your time is dedicated to uh, serving in this executive or you know, administrative uh, capacity, if you will, and you still have the vast majority of your time dedicated to client service. Is that a normal thing uh, across consulting industry that even the chief executive spend the majority of their time still with client, or is it more specific to the 
so-called um, servant leader model that Bain perhaps employs? Uh, you know, in, in my view, uh, it, it, this should be the way that the servant leadership uh, model uh, runs. Um, you know, we're, we're privileged or I'm privileged to be in this position because Bain it has a partnership model, right? In a sense, this is a uh, collection of entrepreneurs. So each of our 1100 partners globally huh, uh, is an entrepreneur. Uh, so they, uh, they, you know, for the majority of the time uh, can really just drive themselves and uh, govern themselves. So in a sense, right, the management duty uh, for a CEO, either a global CEO or a, or a regional CEO, um, the job is easy, <laughs> relatively speaking. Yeah. Only when, uh, so the, the, I guess the, the pressure only comes in when there's a crisis somewhere and the CEO have to. Well, certainly, I mean, well, you know, I mean, we do do some work. Uh, of course, crisis management uh, during COVID or during a war, uh, of course, uh, or, or during some, some special uh, 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 people situations that we, we definitely need to, need to jump in. Uh, obviously, you know, crafting a strategy uh, that uh, is coherent uh, within the firm, right? Globally, locally, by different practice, different uh, different capability areas. That's important. And of course, we also have a set of procedures. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for the majority of the time, the partners can govern themselves, but we do need uh, some process, uh, some procedure to make sure people are, you know, doing the right thing. Uh, so, so that's kind of where my 20% time is spent. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, let's take a uh, jump back, I guess, to mm. the time you graduated from uh, Fudan University in Shanghai. I believe it's in the early 1990s, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. 1996 is when I graduated. 1996. Um, so when you graduated, China was starting to embrace market reforms uh, after, you know, Deng Xiaoping's uh, policies and um, management consulting at that point was not very well known uh, mm -hmm. of an industry in China. Uh, yeah. And very few people uh, ever worked at it. And some, you know, some people never heard of it. So why did you, uh, as a fresh graduate uh, from one of the best universities in China, decide to go into such a fresh industry? Uh, uh, if, if our students are interested, I will go back to kind of history, <laughs> ancient sure. history, and, and talk about sort of where, where I was and how the atmosphere uh, was. But I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it uh, so that you feel I'm kind of the dinosaur from the dinosaur generation. Uh, so uh, if you think about sort of in the mid 90s, that's when, as you said, David, uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping's 92, Shenzhen visits, and then uh, also the opening up uh, of the Pudong uh, Pudong area uh, that basically created this market uh, place for talents. Uh, if I had graduated just a couple years before, uh, I would have been in this uh, sort of uh, planned economy where, you know, basically the college grads get assigned to uh, whatever jobs that uh, that were available. Mostly, obviously, with state-owned enterprise or uh, with government jobs. Uh, so I think it was early 90s when we first started this two-way street where the students can choose a company and then the company could choose uh, the talents. So, so I was fortunate that uh, I graduated uh, in a, a relatively already pretty free market. Um, you asked about management consulting. Uh, I'll be also very honest at the time. Uh, I or most people had very little knowledge of what it was. Uh, internet uh, was just starting uh, in China and uh, actually not everybody had uh, access to internet to uh, understand what the industry uh, was and uh, what companies were all about. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I had a uh, one piece of sort of information, which is a book. I think it was called the Hoover's, uh, like a company, company introduction or something. So for each company, there is a one page, it's a paper copy, uh, one page introduction. And then I graduated from Fudan with a management information system uh, degree or major. 
so I look through this Hoover's handbook and then there's a page uh, talking about Anderson Consulting. Uh, and then uh, uh, within the description, it says, we specialize in management information system. So I thought, uh, ooh, that really fits my major. Uh, so just went uh, to their comp uh, campus presentation, uh, went through the interview process. And later on, I only found out that uh, obviously Anderson is now uh, called Accenture. It's a very successful consulting firm. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really selective at the time. And then it pays a little bit above the average, which was a big deal for a few hundred RMB per month uh, extra. So, uh, so, so that's how I ended up in the, in the industry. And of course, later on, uh, as I went to the Booth uh, Business School at, uh, at Chicago, uh, I, I jumped ship. Uh, actually, it wasn't even jumping ship because I was recruited also on campus. I left uh, Accenture to join, uh, to go to Booth and then uh, join, join Bain, uh, as you said, uh, since 2002. Great. Um, so, so you first worked at Accenture and then went to Booth. At what point in that time, during that time at Accenture, did you decide that you probably need an MBA degree and you probably want to go to the United States and, you mm -hmm. know, best of all, you probably uh, should, go, should have gone to Booth. What, what, how is that decision making like for you at that point? Because mm -hmm. it's a big investment, right? You have to uh, yeah. a hefty sum to get that degree. Um, so I actually made that decision even before I graduated from college. I knew that I needed a, uh, I mean, the, the greater context here is that uh, those were the, uh, the time of a very benign uh, US-China <laughs> uh, relationship. And uh, there was a wave, a huge wave of uh, Chinese students uh, going abroad or right, studying abroad. Uh, when I was graduating, I was eyeing on an MBA uh, degree uh, already, and I knew that uh, you know a couple years of working experience was uh, not 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 just desired but also required uh, to uh, to enter a a top MBA program. So pretty much, I knew what I wanted uh, even before I graduated. And of course, Anderson Consulting or or now Accenture provided a great uh, platform for me. Uh, to get the global experience. I, I worked half of those four years uh, in the United States and half in China, you know, global training and so forth that really paved the way, right, for a, uh, a U.S. Ed education. So has what you learned uh, doing that two years in Booth been uh, in any way useful uh, in your career? It's totally useful. I mean, without, uh, first of all, in those years, without, say, uh, MBA degree from a top uh, business school, you wouldn't have landed a job like a, like a Bain. So, so from a career uh, opportunity standpoint, it definitely helped. And then the education uh, itself, it's, uh, it's also very, very important. Uh, I think what I learned from Booth the most that uh, still benefits me today is critical thinking, mm. right? So, uh, you know, as a consultant, as a advisor to again right principal investors if if you know we i don't uh, apply the critical thinking apply the the very deep work uh, to understand the essence of a certain industry certain organization certain you know business issue you know i i wouldn't be able to do the job that i'm doing today and then i guess uh, also uh, just from a social networking uh, standpoint uh, I made some of my best friends in uh, in business school at at Booth. Uh, you know, people say that you make real friends uh, in schools, right? Because you don't you know have too much uh, political or economical right. agenda. Uh, so 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 you go through certain things together, and then you uh, you really forge a very strong relationship with uh, with your classmates and friends. Great. Um... So you mentioned, right, you know, when you started a, first at Henderson and, and later at Bing, you know, a uh, computer is not that popular in China, definitely not as uh, popular as it is today. Computer was uh, by the time I, I was in college, but not internet. So Angel. we had these standalone, standalone sure. PCs that don't talk to you. Once. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but not, not definitely not an iPad or an iPhone that anyone have uh, uh, one today. So at that point, there's a lot of, uh, you can say, information asymmetry. 
uh, in the business world where consultants are often hired as they were in the last century uh, to help collect information and run some analytics on it and then generate some insights, right? I think that's what yes. the value add was for, for a long time. But you know, today, I almost feel like uh, any three-year-old could uh, uh, put up their Baidu or Google and find out uh, what they need on the internet. And everybody have this kind of level playing field in terms of information gathering. So your perspective, and, and of course, from the perspective of the firm, what value are consultants adding today beyond just the collection uh, and processing of, of data? Correct. Look, uh, I'll tell you the, some secrets about uh, my industry, okay? Sure. And don't tell anyone else. Um, so the value add or the value chain of my industry goes like this. So you do start from information and then you go with some analysis in order to drive some insights, as you said. But that whole part is only, call it 20% of the value add, okay? The more value add is on the latter part of the chain, which is from insights, you need to drive change in the organization. Right. Uh, and then only with change, there could be differential results. Mm. Okay, of course, we need to make the right change in order to drive positive results. If you don't drive the right change, you have negative results. So the more value add of my industry is actually on the latter part, the change management and then the results generation. Uh, you're right, David, if you go back 20 years, right? I've been with Bain for almost 20 years now. Um, information collection was still quite valuable, right? Because uh, at the time I was working in China and then the investors or the uh, corporate executives when they want to make a big decision, they just don't know enough about the market, about the competition, about the regulatory, about customers and so on and so forth. So they would hire someone like Bain to quote unquote collect information. Um, and uh, to be honest, even today, that part is still valuable because even with the internet, with the Baidu or, or Google and so forth, you cannot just rely on pieces of information or uh, you know, on internet, right? Because by the way, most of them are, are, are false or incomplete, right? So, uh, so the data collection and analysis part is still uh, important. But I guess, you know, as I grew up at Bain in a relatively unconventional way and working with uh, a lot of the Chinese entrepreneurs, some of them are really grassroots uh, entrepreneurs who have never gone to colleges, uh, sometimes never gone to uh, high schools, they make decision actually in a very different way, right? Data information is important, but they rely a lot on uh, judgment. Uh, uh, they rely on a lot of their instincts, right? So they place a much more emphasis on execution, right? On that code change management part of it. So. So, so, so for me personally, I grew up placing actually relatively lower <laughs> uh, emphasis on the, the front part and a lot more emphasis on the latter part. Great. Um, and you say you work with uh, investment firms and uh, entrepreneurs uh, as part of your the client portfolio. Uh, and there's also uh, just a question that popped up in relation to that. Why don't we uh, mm -hmm. uh, pivot to that topic? So perhaps, you know, for those who are, are not so familiar with the role that consulting firm play in, in private equity. Tell us a little yes. bit about your relationship with PE firms uh, in China, uh, your yes. client. Uh, of course, you don't have to uh, talk about specific cases because of uh, confidentiality, but in general, what, a, what is a typical engagement uh, with a private equity firm like? And what role does Bain play uh, in driving those deals? No, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, uh, I should have mentioned, I mean, I, I alluded a little bit in my 20 years at Bain, the first 10 years, I actually worked a lot with uh, invest, uh, investment firms. And then the later 10 years, I, I focused more on the local Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, by private equity, I shall also sort of define the space a little bit, right? So in our terminology, this is all uh, fall into uh, so-called the financial investment or financial investors space. Uh, in places like the United States or Europe, uh, when people talk about private equity, they refer more to the leverage buyout uh, subsector. Uh, but in China, uh, if people read uh, uh, and, and probably practice in the space, 
uh, uh, leverage buyout is actually a smaller part of the financial investment uh, in China. Majority of the uh, money actually goes into either venture capital or growth capital, right? Yes. So, so I, you know, we at Bain uh, in China actually work a lot more with the growth capital space than the uh, the uh, leverage buyout, uh, which is quite different than working in uh, uh, in a more mature market like. Uh, uh, like in the United States. Um, so um, let, me, let me answer that question more directly. Uh, when we work with private, uh, private equity firms, 80% uh, of the time we're working on deals. Sure. And 20% of the time we actually work with the uh, organization as if it's uh, any other corporate clients. We help them with strategy and organization and operations and all that, right? So. Uh, since the interest is more on the 80% the deal process, I'll, I'll focus my time on that. Um, we actually help uh, uh, investors uh, in the whole chain of uh, making a deal, right? From deal generation to due diligence to portfolio management, or sometimes we, we call it uh, post acquisition support, and then exit. Right, so uh, I see the question talking about due diligence. That's really just a small part of uh, of the whole uh, deal making. Uh, in the Chinese word, uh, you know, it's it's one step in the in the long march. Right, so okay, you did the due diligence. Even when you made the deal, right, that's only one step uh, of a of a long march. Think about exit. So being, huh? You have to think about exit as soon as you make the investment. You need to think about value creation. And then you, you think about exit, right? Obviously you have exit, uh, exit, exit in your mind when you make a deal. Uh, so being as a consultant, we, uh, we, we support uh, these investors on deal generation. We help them to source deals. We help them to uh, screen uh, or, or, or study certain sectors. Uh, of course, we help on due diligence, which includes different kinds of due diligences. We don't do legal due diligence, we don't do uh, too much financial due diligence, but we do commercial, we do operational, we do technology, we do ESG, mm. uh, you know, environment, social, and, and governance kind of due diligence. So, so we do participate a lot in the due diligence space. Uh, and then we do a lot on uh, value creation uh, after the investment. <clears throat> you know, um, the reason, David, I kind of pivoted to serving directly to the uh, uh, and Chinese entrepreneurs is is basically uh, I was doing you know a lot of work with the investors and then post investment uh, I started to work with the quote quote unquote investees basically the entrepreneurs who raise money from these funds um, and very quickly <clears throat> the my client becomes these uh, entrepreneurs right so so working with the entrepreneurs working with the shareholders I guess now with the with the investors. Um, to basically help the company to continue to grow, continue to upgrade their organization, continue to cut cost, you know, basically have a better uh, financial and organizational results. Um, and then some companies uh, went listed or got sold off to uh, either new shareholders. And then Bain is still there. Uh, and we went is still there working with the new shareholders, working with the entrepreneurs if they are still on the job. Uh, basically, it's a lifelong <laughs> relationship uh, across very different, uh, you know, cycles of a company's development. So, uh, for I don't know, what's the, like uh, average uh, length uh, of of a company that they have a relationship with? Is it no longer just a one year thing, or is a multi year relation that you hold? It's with multi decades. Multi decades. So, yes. Multi decades. Uh, I give you one example. By the way, you, you, you are in the venture business. Uh, maybe you think about, you know, a couple of years of holding periods and exits. But my, you know, if, if you allow me, my advice is to stick uh, with the company uh, in a perpetual term. Uh, yes. Even, you know, with or without money, huh? that's an important twist. I, I work with these entrepreneurs because they, their job is perpetual. Right, it's not like a professional manager. You know, you think about okay, three years as a CEO, and then maybe I move on. Maybe at a certain point I retire. Entrepreneurs don't retire, right? It's their company. Uh, it's it's across the whole life. We we have this term called uh, client for life, right? Yeah. So when we stick to a, a entrepreneur, we stick to them 
uh, uh, lifelong. So um, again, it's not always with a big project, right? That I get paid. It's important that I am I'm there during good times and bad times, and I support them, you know, using my, you know, to the maximum of my ability or the ecos ability of my ecosystem, right? Uh, uh, both my bean resources and then the ecosystem of, of Bain's resources to help the company, right? So that's the mentality that I apply uh, every time, either I work with an investor or with, a, with an entrepreneur. And when you have this kind of a multi-year, multi-decade relationship, you're no longer just selling, let's say, a one-off advice, right? You're not just selling one set of very well-made PowerPoint. You're selling change, you're selling sometimes implementations. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a mainstream uh, or a growing trend now in the Asian market where a lot of uh, strategy consulting firms actually have the majority of their work outside of the typical strategy consulting uh, field, right? If you yes. define it narrowly, it's more of an implementation change driven. Does that affect uh, the way that uh, the, the business is, is monetized? Does it, because in the past, you can just perhaps sell a report for a, you know, a few million dollars uh, and, and then you, 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 you get out of that, uh, that deal and you're done, but now it's an ongoing process and you create value. How does uh, the accounting change? Do you now ask for a portion of the profit, uh, mm -hmm. or revenue being generated as a kind of a performance based fee? Uh, mm -hmm. is that a mainstream or a trend that you are, uh, observing mm -hmm. in the Chinese market? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, um, 50 years ago when Bain was first founded, uh, by Bill Bain, uh, we already made it clear that Bain is not in the business of selling reports. Mm -hmm. We are in the business of selling results, right? So as remember my value chain of, of, of my business, right? The, the report part, sometimes it's important, yes. but it's the uh, front end. The real value add is the change uh, management and it is the results generation. So, so in my mind, you know, we've always been in the business of selling results. Uh, and uh, through that journey, we get paid a little bit of money, you know, a fraction of what the principal investors are making. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's kind of my business, right? Uh, after all, you know, I'm a business of talents and business of, you know, um, uh, some kind of resources, like, uh, you know, we have some expertise, we have an ecosystem, but, but, you know, in a company or entrepreneur's development, it is part of his or her ecosystem too, right? So I, I reckon that I only contributed a little part to their success. So I collect some money for the, for the, uh, uh, my investment and, and their return, uh, uh, a fraction of, of that success. Um, uh, if if I, I speak uh, technically about our fee structure, um, the performance based fee um, technically is still a smaller part of our overall fees. Okay. Most of these are still fixed fees. However, if you stretch the time horizon long enough, I would say 100% of our fees are results based <laughs> because if we don't deliver results, Clients won't come back and buy us, right? 80% of Bain's clients are repeat clients, okay? okay? Only 20% are new clients. So, so I would say at least 80% of our business are results-based because if we don't deliver good results for the previous project, we won't get the next project, right? So that's the way I think about it. That's, uh, that's definitely a, a great way of, of portraying it that 80% uh, of the repeat customer are all paying for the results. I, I couldn't agree more, uh, especially in China, if you don't deliver first, uh, people, it's hardly to have someone to come back uh, and hire you again. So you mentioned- Anywhere in the world. Anywhere, anywhere in the world. world. Absolutely. Of course, the results are defined, let me be clear, huh? Results are defined in many different senses, okay? Uh, financial results, certainly, right? That's the ultimate, one of the ultimate uh, uh, goals. But there are social, value, right, that you help to create. There's the organizational results that help you to create. There's uh, talking about entrepreneurs. Uh, it's not just developing their company. It's about developing themselves. And then oftentimes in the China context, it's about developing their children <laughs> to make them successful. So the definition of a resource generation is actually quite broad.
Absolutely. Um, and I want to go back when you mentioned briefly about, um, you know, the uh, differences of uh, the private equity market in, in China vis-a-vis -vis the United States uh, yeah. or other developed market. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had uh, uh, Mr. David Rubenstein from the Carlyle Group joining, uh, joining us uh, from the U.S. And he was talking about how in the U.S. in the past decade, there are more and more growth equity and, and private debt and, and there are right. less and less uh, LBOs. But it seems yeah. to you that in China, uh, the country started uh, with a lot more uh, growth equity and venture capital than they are LBO because of the yeah. differences in the maturity of the market. Yeah. I guess if you just take a bird's eye view uh, of the Chinese, let's not say private equity, but private, private investment market, right? Including yes. uh, private equity and, and uh, venture capital. Uh, where is that going uh, in, in yeah. China? Do you also mm -hmm. see a convergence of return of the private and public market in China as it is like in the West? Or is there some different trend that you see in the Chinese market? Um, it's a very dynamic market. Um, you know, if you talk to me a couple months ago, the answer may be a little different. You talk to me now, if you, if you talk to me six months from now, the answer may be a little different. But I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit the long-term uh, trend view uh, that's not influenced by the short term, uh, either geopolitical uh, tension or some government regulatory uh, changes and all that, right? <clears throat> um, the long my long term view is that uh, private investment uh, will continue to be uh, a very important source of, uh, of funding for companies and particularly for the private uh, sector, right? The private uh, part of the economy, vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a state owned yes. uh, part yes. of the economy. Uh, the reason, right? Uh, talking about different funding mechanism, um, you know, of course, of course, the bank debt is relatively limited to the smaller uh, or SMEs or, or private enterprises. Uh, IPO is a highly regulated uh, space. Um, and uh, one could argue that uh, the Chinese public equity market is not as mature uh, or performance driven than, the, than a more mature public equity market. Uh, so I think the private, the private uh, investment uh, will continue uh, to, to be a very important force. Um, within the private uh, investment, uh, I, I still believe in uh, both uh, the innovation, uh, sort of the venture uh, part of the equation. Uh, China is highly, highly innovative uh, high, uh, and not just the business model innovation, but also just technology innovation uh, and then even sometimes hardcore technology innovation. Um, China is also highly, highly digital, right? So, uh, you know, you see, uh, you see uh, a lot of the uh, uh, digital transformation that's going on in many, many sectors. So I do think the uh, venture capital and then growth capital is going to be very big. Um, uh, leverage buyout markets is not still not very mature today uh, because uh, of several uh, reasons. Uh, the, a lot of the uh, companies or the entrepreneurs uh, are not too used to sell <laughs> uh, control of their companies. I think uh, that'll change maybe in 10, 20 years. Uh, you start to see a little bit already, huh? uh, but it's not the mainstream. Uh, the, why do I say 10, 20 years? Uh, because a lot of these entrepreneurs are in their 50s and 60s. In tw 10, 20 years, uh, they'd be retiring or you know, uh, uh, their, their kids may not want to take over the company. So, so that creates opportunities. Another big reason why leverage buyout is not popular is the whole readiness of the professional management, uh, professional management class. Um, a lot of the private enterprises are still run by the owners. Uh, so having the right professional managers who think and act like owners <clears throat> and have the expertise and capability to run a company in a holistic way uh, will take some time. I see a note from, uh, from the Q&A uh, 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 chat there, chat box there. I mean, you, you could, you know, people in this room, right, could prepare yourselves 
uh, have that both the founder or the owner's mentality and the general management skills. That's how you can participate in either you know, joining one of these funds as a portfolio uh, team or, or as an investor uh, or as a consultant or as a professional manager within these companies to try to uh, take on right, part or sometimes the whole job of an entrepreneur uh, to run the companies and bring the companies to the, to the next level. I couldn't agree with you more uh, on the point that China is perhaps uh, businesses in China, the private ones are facing a uh, succession uh, crisis, uh, perhaps not in 20 years, maybe in 10, because some of uh, our parents' generation are, are entering uh, the retirement age. And uh, it, is tr- it is true, a lot of companies uh, will need professional managers or new owners. I, I guess that is a positive sign for the private equity invest uh, or leverage buyout industry, uh, also a positive sign. In the long run, for in your, the, in the ten, in, the even in 10 years, right? That's relatively long. Uh, and uh, it's only going to be, the opportunity is only going to be available for those who are prepared, sure. right? So most, I tell you, most investors today in China are financial, uh, or had a financial background. You have more bankers than consultants. You have more bankers than operators in the investment space, which is quite different than uh, than in uh, in uh, other mature market, right? So I, I do see in the long run, there will be a shift uh, with more practitioners in the investment space who have consulting or operational experiences. Uh, great, uh, thank you for uh, that uh, very relevant uh, uh, insight uh, on, on, on the fee industry. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, just uh, going back a little bit to uh, your background, uh, you became uh, head of Bank China uh, 2016 after almost, uh, I think, 15 years in the firm. Uh, you, of course, you made partner, you went through the entire corporate letter uh, in China. How, how was it like, were you the first, uh, I guess, native born Chinese to make uh, into the position of managing partner of China? Uh, I, I remember your predecessor uh, is non-Chinese, right? But, uh, how was it like to, to be able to climb that corporate ladder uh, of American firm uh, in China? Um, yeah, indeed, I, I, I am uh, still the first one. Uh, I, I, my three predecessors, there are two Americans and one European. <laughs> okay. um, I assume they speak Chinese. Nobody speak, spoke Chinese. Okay, okay. No, no, none of them spoke Chinese. Um, that, you know, I, I think... Uh, I think we should talk a little bit about the generational changes, right, of not just Spain, but any multinational uh, operating in China. Uh, because at uh, the early days, of course, you know, uh, sitting from headquarters, you would like to send somebody uh, who you trust and then who understand the company and then who has the experience or maturity, right, to run the business, right? So it's not uh, surprising that for most firms, uh, maybe all firms, right, they started with expat model, right? And then over time, uh, this is a little bit unique for China. Uh, you, you start to see some Hong Kong or Taiwanese or Singaporean uh, to run the China business, right? After all, uh, those markets were you know, open before China, mainland China did. Uh, and uh, and developed some more talents uh, earlier, right? So not surprising. And then you also see a wave of mainland Chinese uh, start to grow up and, uh, and get more experience and so forth. Uh, and after all, you know, mainland China is the bigger market compared to Hong Kong or 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 Taiwan. So so gradually you you see more mainland Chinese taking the role. Um, I I would not really call it climbing the corporate ladder because we're a partnership model, right? Anybody can become a partner and anybody who wants to can take on a servant leadership role, not, not, just, not just this one role. Um, so, so it's in a sense, uh, both kind of your readiness and your willingness. Not, that, not everybody wants this job, okay? It's a pretty, as I said, right? It's a, you, know, you, you, you basically added your uh, added uh, responsibilities and, and work, not necessarily you know, uh, making more money or anything like that, right? It's a responsibility that you're taking on. So in a sense, it's, uh, it's kind of a, you know, the word servant leadership, right? It's a service job, right? I'm here to service the 40 partners that I have, 
And then I'm sitting on the board it's to service the, the 1100 partners that we have as a, as a firm, right? So, so it's kind of an extra responsibility and extra commitment uh, to kind of give something back, right? Of course, with that investment, you also get some fame, right? You get some you know, uh, 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 media exposure uh, stuff, you get something back, but the, in, 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 in essence, it's still a service job. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, couldn't agree with you more. And on the group chat, uh, one of our audience asked, uh, Alan, <laughs> why Bain? I think it's a question that every person, uh, student who graduated from college interviewing at Bain will be asked that question. So I, I'm going to hit that question uh, to you. Uh, so, so why stay for 20 years at this firm? What is it about Bain that is unique that makes you want to stay for uh, such a long time rising to, uh, to lead it in China? And how does Bain, I guess, position itself against its competitors? Uh, yes. Perhaps uh, the international ones, um, McKinsey and BCG, but also the local players. How does it differentiate itself uh, in the Chinese market? So I'll, I'll ask, I'll answer Alan's first question, why Bain? And then I'll talk about why I stayed for, for, for this long. Um, Bain is the youngest uh, and the smallest and the most uh, uh, dynamic, fastest growing. Uh, and in my view, and the, I, I think in every Bainese, we call, it, call ourselves Bainese, in every Bainese view, the most uh, collaborative and supportive uh, firm, uh, or if you're comparing us with the uh, the other two of the NDD, huh? Um, for me personally, and then I, I talk to students all the time, you know, do you want to join a bigger firm or do you want to join a faster growing firm? Mm. And to me, the answer is quite clear. Oh, you already know the answer because growth brings opportunities. Yes. Growth brings the, that upward, right? The, the, the headroom for you to, for you to develop. Uh, and then we're, we, we tend to think we're, you know, more uh, dynamic because right? smaller yes. ships can, can turn e more easily. Uh, and then we tend to think we, we, I mean, this, I can go on for hours, but uh, due to some historical events, Bain is a, a place that really has the strongest uh, bonds between partners and between consultants, between, between our teams. Uh, we invest uh, differentially uh, uh, into that culture development, uh, training and events and so on and so forth. We, we, we over invest in just having that, we, we call a Baini never let another Baini fail, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, mentality and culture, right? So, so I think we attract uh, people uh, uh, who, who want growth, uh, who wants uh, to fight for a bigger future, and then who prefer to work in an environment that people support each other. Um, so that's kind of my short why, why Bain. Uh, you, 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 if you go, ever go into an interview room uh, of, of a Bain interview, uh, try to make those points, but in your own words. Yes. And, then in your, and then with your own experience, uh, dealing or interacting with uh, the main people so that you sound more uh, genuine. <laughs> so don't just copy my words. <laughs> uh, um, now about why I, I, I stayed this long, right? Um, so first of all, I uh, was not the kind of guy that, uh, you know, basically uh, contemplates a lot of options, opportunities all the time. I do contemplate my options probably every three years. <laughs> uh, so as you can imagine, with my almost 20 years with Bain, I did seriously consider leaving Bain quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Not always, but quite a few times. Um, but I guess I, I stayed because one, uh, the, uh, the fact that in my 20 years at Bain, I probably changed my job every two, three years, okay? Uh, from a individual contributor to a project manager, uh, to a business developer, to a people developer, to a firm developer. So, so, so every two, three years, just as you're getting better at what you do, 
you get a new job. So, so it was the job is never dull in the sense, right? So, so, so of course, with that change of jobs, and uh, and uh, and I guess uh, elevation of responsibilities, I, I also get a lot of satisfaction, right? Satisfaction not just in the financial sense, but uh, in many. I mean, mostly it's from people, uh, from both development of, of my clients or my people, right? So, so that's kind of why uh, the internal, I guess, the internal forces. And then from an external forces standpoint, I, I got you know opportunities mostly with my clients. The one piece of advice I may give to the audience today is that don't take uh, calls from a headhunter okay. uh, because uh, if if a job is available through an agency, usually that means uh, first of all you don't know the company, the company don't know you, right? So you're brokered with that opportunity, just like, uh, you know, in, in Shanghai, in China, we try to find an IE at home, right? I, I, my wife never find an IE through the agencies because the people who are available uh, with the agencies usually means they don't have a job, right? They, don't, they cannot get a repeat client using, using my earlier, earlier point. So, so my opportunities had always come from my clients, always. Okay, so I got opportunities with uh, private equity firms. I got opportunities with private entrepreneurs or private enterprises, always. But uh, the reason I haven't gone there, uh, any of those, is uh, I weigh the opportunity and I weigh the return. Uh, and then by now I had the re I had the privilege to look at who eventually got those jobs and then compared to where I am today. I kind of felt like, you know, I, I would not be better off. So the grass is not greener on, <laughs> on another side. Of course, right? I, 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 how would I know, right? I, I never tried it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not here to, you know, preach that you never take on the outside opportunity, right? There's a saying of YOLO, right? You only live once. Uh, but the only uh, advice I may give is uh, you, uh, you, you, you know, don't come in where the grass is greener on the other side, the point of view, but rather uh, think about who you are, what you want uh, in your life, and then evaluate these opportunities in a, more, a holistic manner, right? It's not like, oh, they give you more money, right? And more money, you know, is it more money today or is it mo more money in three years or is it more money lifelong, right? Or it's exciting, right? It's new. But is it new in one month, three months, or three years, or thirty years? Right. So, so basically, take a long term and holistic view on on these opportunities. So, thank you so much for that uh, extremely frank and honest uh, account of your own career and uh, career decisions. I, I guess we would like to turn our attention uh, in the last uh, segment of our uh, chat today to perhaps some uh, macro trend that's happening. Uh, in China and in the industry, and then just overall your impression on them. Uh, we want to appreciate it. The first one, I think we really uh, briefly touch upon you when you record that your three predecessors are all uh, Westerners and you're the first Chinese because you realize that you have a generational change uh, in the Chinese uh, managers and, and, and leadership. Um, so you know, in the first few decades of China's opening up, the consulting firm, they can simply succeed by bringing successful experience uh, from abroad to China implemented in the Chinese firm, reforming them. Uh, but today, it seems like a lot of the global best practices comes from China, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the tech industry, in the consumer industry. Uh, yeah. A lot of innovation happens in China. Yeah. So how does uh, a firm uh, as global as Bain um, react to that, right? Do you put more resources and focus on China, really trying to understand what is making the Chinese uh, companies work and what is their best practices and bring that to the West? Is that something that reverse uh, maybe exporting of expertise from China? Are you seeing that happening? Is Bain taking an action on that? Sure, sure. And that's a great question. And to, to answer that question, I'll, I'll uh, tell you another secret. <laughs> and this time, not about my industry, but about my firm, uh, and particularly the greater China business. Um, as we came in to China about 30 years ago, uh, we had a couple of missions in mind. Of course, that mission uh, gets refreshed uh, a couple of times. Uh, when we first come, our, our primary mission is to serve our global 
uh, accounts in a seamless way, right? To basically to go with your customer, right? To enter the market with your customer. Uh, and even today, that's still our one of our primary missions, okay? We are a global firm. Uh, a lot of our, of our global uh, clients that, uh, that still uh, invest a lot in China, despite all the macro uh, challenges. Uh, China, you know, nobody, right? Nobody in the world can ignore uh, China as such a big economy uh, and, and power. So that remains one of our uh, missions. The second mission is to actually develop the local Chinese clients, uh, both, uh, you know, for business reason, but also for learning, right? As you say, David, a lot of the best practices, the expertise actually come from China. So we uh, in, in the first two decades, we basically imported a lot of these expertise uh, from, from elsewhere, but now we're exporting. We're a net exporter of the expertise, right? And then the third one is kind of related to that second mission is to position China as really the testing ground for innovation, uh, innovation in terms of business model, talent model, innovation in terms of the type of work we do, like a digital, like ESG and so forth. And just using China as a pioneer, right? To test out a lot of the stuff that uh, Bain wants to do globally. After all, right, Bain globally is a $6 billion company, 1100 partners, and then China is relatively small, uh, but we're in a vast uh, market and so innovative market. So we can actually, again, right? Smaller ships can, can turn uh, faster, uh, we can actually uh, pilot a lot of the changes we want to make uh, globally. And in fact, we did. Uh, in my five years as uh, China head, we uh, implemented a lot of, lot of innovation, a lot of changes, right? And that both drive, uh, drove our growth uh, to about 20% a year, but also the portfolio mix change, right? The uh, What we call the generalist versus specialist talent model, yes. we have a lot more specialists now uh, in order to do these more operational or implementation driven work uh, we, uh, uh, we we do uh, 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 many other many other uh, sort of innovation or tests uh, in this market too great um, thank you for uh, sharing that another uh, very uh, high uh, top of the mind question for many uh, foreign investor or, or just students who want to go and perhaps work in China uh, is regulatory risk that, that uh, we've been seeing uh, in recent years, right? And I think the Chinese government are being more involved uh, in the economy. Uh, that's not a uh, controversial statement, I hope. And uh, uh, sometimes they will promote industry, sometimes they will uh, regulate them or clamp down uh, on some of them even. Um, the, I guess the private tutoring uh, industry in China is an is example of that. So when you advise your client, many of them are foreign uh, or foreign investors, um, foreign companies operating in China. How do you tell them, you know, the, the way to deal with the, uh, the, the regulatory risk in China? How, how do you assess the risk and react? We, uh, we obviously had a lot of conversations with, uh, with the investors around the world on this. In fact, uh, this afternoon, I'm talking to one of the leading US <laughs> uh, funds about, about China. Um, look, I have a few uh, points that I have been making with my clients. Uh, first, uh, we should accept in a cyclical view, in a cycle view, huh? we will, I mean, the investment uh, community will be facing some tough times, yes. okay, in the, in the coming years. Uh, last year was uh, yet again a record year for GPs, the general partners, meaning the funds, investors, uh, put money to work in China. Uh, about 50% goes to technology, mm. okay? And 50% goes to relatively more traditional uh, industries. Uh, and you, you guys all have seen uh, the bloodbath of uh, all the listed uh, tech firms, uh, either in the US or Hong Kong or China. Um, so, uh, so we should expect right, some years of, uh, uh, of, uh, of tough times uh, in terms of the fundraising, in terms of the 
available deals, uh, how much you can put money to work. And in terms of talent, to be quite honest, right? Uh, with a shrinking shrinking market, at least uh, for a period, that's tough for, uh, for, for talents. But again, I put it in a cyclical view because, uh, you know, investment or financial market itself, you know, by definition, it's very cyclical. Uh, I, I still believe in the fundamental sort of economy and, uh, and, and the drivers, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to, uh, to private investments, right? Um, even, even in a relatively tougher uh, regulatory environment, we still see many uh, opportunities. Uh, I'll give you several examples. There is uh, uh, China for China. Mm -hmm. There's still that opportunity because, uh, um, you know, the, the innovative uh, businesses, right, uh, either in consumer or retail or healthcare or financial services and so forth, still sort of emerging. So, so the traditional growth capital, venture capital still have a, have a, have a, have a role to play. Um, uh, secondly, you, you can ride on some sort of macro waves. ESG is a big one or environment. The, the, the decarbonization yes. is a big one. Uh, electrical vehicle, for example, or any sort of anything related to that uh, industry uh, could be a big, uh, big theme. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sort of China government uh, uh, initiative, right? Yes. So you can, you can ride that wave. There is China for global. Right, because the uh, Chinese companies have accumulated so much expertise and the infrastructure and so forth, right? So that we're exporting. We're exporting infrastructure development, we're exporting you know, money, we're in, uh, exporting uh, business models, we're exporting talents, right? So we are seeing investments going to backing Chinese companies going global, right? Um, and then uh, there is, there is still global for China, right? Some of even the China focused funds, I won't mention the names here, who started to invest uh, elsewhere. Uh, and then the thesis would be to bring, again, the cumulative expertise and infrastructure or talents and bring them to China. Um, you know, deals, deals uh, that, uh, you know, assets in overseas market that has very little China exposure today. Uh, got acquired by Chinese investors so that they can bring those brands or technology or talents or whatever, right, to, to China. That's also happening. So, um, so I guess short term from a macro standpoint, it's a challenging market, but on the micro level, again, as an investor or as an operator or as a consultant, yes, we need to be aware of the macro, but really opportunities are in the micro. Right, to find those themes, those pieces uh, that still have opportunities. And uh, you know, you grab a few of those, you'd be still okay uh, for your own career. Okay, well, thank you for that. And uh, in terms of career advice, uh, one of the uh, audience uh, was actually uh, an incoming uh, associate consultant, I think in the Greater China office. So uh, he's here to uh, also ask you a question about uh, what do you think uh, is the key characteristic to be a successful entry-level analyst slash consultant uh, in, in a firm like Bain? What do you look for uh, when you assess young people? This, this uh, individual has already joined Bain, so it's not about what we look for. So wh wh whoever this is, you can just uh, uh, you know, talk to him or her and just understand what quality he, he <laughs> or, or she has. Uh, but in terms of uh, general advice, it's not necessarily confined to the main environment. I think uh, probably to anybody who, 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 who just joined the, 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 the workforce. Uh, I think one is to just remain the curiosity, right? Um, I think uh, all of you are intellectuals, you know, from one of the finest institutions in the world. So you, you should already have that intellectual curiosity, don't let that fade over time. Uh, in Chinese, we say right? So in my industry in particular, right, we have to learn new things all the time, including where I am and including where, where I will be 20 years from now. Um, the second one I, I want to say is uh, adaptive or adaptable. Um, 
you know, the world is changing, you know, our job, our company is changing, our clients are changing. You cannot just stick to one sort of uh, way of working, uh, one way of dealing with people, dealing with issues. Uh, be adaptable to your environment, not like, I know, you know, your generation is all generation Y, if not generation Z, right? The individualism is, is important. Uh, of course, don't lose that. But at the same time, be adaptive to the environment is, is, is quite critical. Uh, the third, uh, uh, maybe the last one uh, in the interest of time uh, is, is resilience. Yes. Right. So uh, uh, as I compare sort of your student life versus professional life, um, you know, um, a lot of things are may not be 100 percent in your own control. Right. There are ups and downs. Of course, in academic world, you, there are ups and downs, too. But in the in the business world, it's it's uh, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it could come uh, with uh, with uh, tough times you know, uh, things that are not under your control. Uh, sometimes you wanna quit, right? Uh, on WeChat moments, there's a saying, right? Uh, <laughs> quit, right? Uh, it's, it's easy to say I quit. It's not that easy to say I'm all in, yeah. right? So do the difficult, sometimes make the more difficult decision to actually say, I will work this through. Right, I, I will be resilient. I work work things through. Uh, again, using a Chinese, there are so many uh, Chinese, Chinese idioms, right? 退一步海阔天空, right? So sometimes you push over that hump, and then suddenly the roads are are much wider. But sometimes people, and then quit, right? Quitting may, could become a habit. If you quit once, I mean, you you will quit the second time. You will quit the third time. Uh, and then after a few times, you find yourself cornered uh, in, uh, in your professional choices. Great. Thank you for that very kind and wise advice, Wei Wen. Our last, last question is actually a tradition that we ask every single one of our speakers uh, since the beginning of this series. Uh, and it's kind of a fun question uh, uh, that, 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 that get your brain juice flowing. Um, are you ready for that? Sure, why not? So if you are to create uh, a vending machine that can supply a unlimited amount of a certain product, what would that certain product be? And where would you put that vending machine? Mm. You know, I, I think in today's world, uh, it has to be love. Okay. Uh, the world is too, uh, the too uh, uncertain, right? Fortunately, you know, for us in China, we don't have wars. Uh, but there, there are people who are even more miserable. But unfortunately, you know, as the West, uh, you know, opened up uh, uh, with with the uh, with the COVID situation, China is uh, once again locked down. Right? We we need a lot of love uh, uh, with each other and to to give and to receive. Um, where I would put that vending machine, we need that in our own houses. We need that in our own organizations. We need that uh, in the in the whole society. That's what all of us need. Well, and on that note, uh, we would like to end uh, our conversation today on the note of love. Uh, and I hope uh, everybody bring a little bit share of that home uh, tonight as a result of uh, this really insightful, enlightening conversation that we had uh, with Wei Wen. So thank you, Wei Wen, again for taking your time. Uh, on Friday morning uh, to join us uh, here at the University of Chicago. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who has participated today in the audience with all those great questions floating. Uh, LTF is hosting its next speaker event on April 20th, uh, so you're welcome to uh, sign up for that. Again, thank you so much. Uh, we want to wish you all the best, uh, your family, the good health uh, during COVID lockdown. I hope to uh, perhaps see you uh, in China in the near future. That's great. And thank you everybody for staying up late uh, for this uh, monologue, more or less. Uh, and David, thank you for uh, a wonderful job posting this and thank you for having me. Okay. Take care and uh, have okay. a great night, everyone. Bye now.